everybody, welcome. Welcome to Lancaster History. Uh, Tom Ryan, our president, who normally gives the greeting, is on vacation in Aruba, enjoying the warm weather. Uh, so I'm taking over for him today. My name is Stephanie Townrow. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs here at Lancaster History. And I'm happy to tell you a little bit about the upcoming programs, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Um, the first thing I'll do in Tom Ryan fashion is remind you that if you have a cell phone uh, to please silence it. Um, we're going to be talking about the mid-19th century today, so we want to get into the spirit of the time period. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is by not having a cell phone go off in the middle of the talk. Um, so here are a couple things that are coming up. On March 12th, we're very excited. We're going to be hosting the Library Company of Philadelphia. Um, Will Fenton from the Library Company is here talking about their new graphic novel called Ghost River, The Rise and Fall of the Conestoga. Um, it's really an interesting project. They were just profiled on NPR yesterday. Um, and it's a fascinating interview if you want to go on the NPR website and look at it. But they'll be here to talk about both that project and about the history of the Conestoga people and uh, the research that they did, which was partly here. Um, and we will have a special display of the treasures from our collection that relate to the Conestoga people. That'll be for that night only on display uh, for you to see. So don't miss it. Um, it's free and there's a couple reservations still available. So you can go on our website. Um, on March 25th at 5.30, uh, I will be in conversation with our assistant curator, Tori Pyle. We'll be bringing out some really amazing quilts from our quilt collection, and we're going to talk about the social and personal histories that are layered into those quilts. You're going to get to see several qu quilts up close and personal from our collection. It'll be a white glove quilt turning, so we'll um, display each quilt and talk about it and show you the next one. That's how it works. Um, <laughs> The tickets are $15 for members and $25 for non-members. On March 26th, our next colloquium is going to be with the University of Pennsylvania uh, Professor Dr. Mia Bay. She'll be talking about how African Americans viewed Thomas Jefferson, um, how they reflected upon him in letters and pamphlets um, from the 1790s and forward. Uh, Jefferson was a slaveholder. Um, but he was also one of the central architects of an American democratic tradition that held an early and abiding appeal for African Americans. As such, he became a central, if unlikely, figure in the African American freedom struggle that took shape alongside the revolution. Uh, Dr. Mia Bay will discuss how, starting in the 1790s, black authors began to talk back to Jefferson in letters, orations, and pamphlets that both praised Jefferson and took him to task. And then on Thursday, April 16th, uh, for our next colloquium, we'll be joined by Dr. Judith Geisberg of Villanova University, and she will join us here to discuss women's views, particularly those of African American women, on the Civil War. Antebellum, Pennsylvania, including Lancaster, Pittsburgh, and Philadelphia, was home to many vibrant black communities. Within these communities, white and black residents disagreed about what the Civil War was about, and women were at the center of these conversations. Dr. Judith Geisberg will relate the stories of some of these women and the sources available to explore their lives. So don't miss it. And now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for tonight, Corey James Young. He's a history PhD candidate at Georgetown University. He received his MA at Georgetown and his BA at SUNY Geneseo. His research interests include abolition, slavery, and migration in the Northern United States. Young's dissertation, For Life or Otherwise, Abolition and Slavery in South Central Pennsylvania from 1780 to 1847, examines how slaveholding and enslaved residents of the Cumberland Valley refashioned bondage in response to gradual abolition laws. Corey is currently an Alfred M. Greenfield Dissertation Fellow at the Library Company of Philadelphia and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and he's also helped to launch the Activist History Review. So please help me welcome Corey James Young. Oh, 
thank you very much, Stephanie. It is a pleasure to be here with you all today. It is cold, it is windy, but we are here and we are going to talk about history. Uh, for first, there's, first, there's a few people that I would like to thank. Stephanie, of course, for organizing this. I'd like to thank Nathan Peace, who's the Director of Library Services here. Last summer, when I was here for the first time, he scanned some materials that have been very useful for me and that I'll be discussing tonight. I'd also like to thank Ty Stump from the State Archives up in Harrisburg. He showed me this incredible document that we'll talk about in just a few minutes, and that's actually going to be on display for Charter Day on March 8th, Sunday, March 8th, as well as the Cosmos Club Foundation, who gave me the money to come and explore these wonderful collections. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Barb Bartos of the Cumberland County Archives, as well as the great folks at the Cumberland County Historical Society, who have really supported my work. And last but not least, uh, as it is a privilege to be here in front of all of you to talk about African American history during Black History Month, I, I would be remiss if I did not thank Dr. Leroy Hopkins, a pioneering scholar of color who literally handed me some of the materials that I'm going to be discussing with you uh, tonight. So as, as we continue with this tradition moving forward, um, I, I know that there will be other scholars of color who will be able to come here and, and share their thoughts about these important topics with you as well. So, show of hands, how many of you remember or learning about as a, a student or just as a member of the Lancaster community about Lancaster and the Underground Railroad? All right. That's, yes, that's what I expected. Uh, <laughs> how many of you learned or remember learning something about enslaved people here in Lancaster? Very good. <laughs> Normally when I ask that question, I don't get quite such a, an enthusiastic response. There is a tendency among Northerners, and I include myself, to, to want to begin so badly with the Underground Railroad and not ask what existed before that that had to be abolished. And so part of what we're gonna be doing tonight is, is talking about that. So I do have some goals for the lecture, some learning objectives. Uh, tonight we're gonna examine the operation and elimination of slavery here in Lancaster County. And we're gonna do that by dispelling some common myths uh, about Northern slavery and abolition. And I want to make sure that by the end of all of this, that we've taken some time to appreciate gradual abolition's deliberate slowness. Gradual is, is in the name. It is as important to the process as the abolition component. And last but not least, I wanna make sure that we share some stories. A, a good historian must also be a good storyteller. And, and I wanna make sure we all walk out of here knowing about someone who maybe we didn't know about before. Okay. Slavery and enslaved people has been in Lancaster since before there was a Lancaster. I wanna talk a bit about the, the founding and the idea of, of founders here in, in Lancaster County. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the names of, of the founding families, the, the Wrights, the Blunstons, the Barbers, who came here in the 1720s and established themselves at Wrights Ferry, what is now Columbia on the Susquehanna River. But from the very beginning, there were enslaved Africans there with them. Uh, by the 1740s, 1750s, uh, there were more than 20 enslaved people here. They came with the founding families. Uh, they were bequeathed in, in wills. They were, they were traded, they were sold, uh, they were freed. They were making their families alongside these founding families. Uh, when Blunston died in 1745, uh, his estate was appraised for 15 enslaved persons. Uh, he left people named Sal and Toby and Virtulus to Susanna Wright, the daughter of John Wright, another one of the founders of, of Lancaster. And he did provide in his will that they should go free after a certain period of time, uh, but that was not before they, they served Susanna Wright and her family. And the other founder, Robert Barber, uh, owned at least four enslaved persons during his lifetime. So the, the three founding names of, of Lancaster, Pennsylvania are only but some of the names of, of the non-native people who came here first. And this is actually true for a number of different places in Pennsylvania. When I was doing research in Cumberland County, 
I was looking at last wills and testaments. And in the very first will book for Cumberland County, dating back to 1750, the very first will, first page of that book, uh, the person is, is leaving enslaved people to his children, people by the name of Whiteball and Patience. So they were in Cumberland County the whole time. Uh, some of you may have heard of Hercules in Harrisburg, who belonged to the Harris family. He's a part of the founding stories of Dauphin County, just to the north of us. And all the way up in Potter County, on the border of New York in the northwestern part of the state, if you ask someone from Potter County, you know, what family founded this place, that would be the Ayers family. But the Ayers family brought with them a young enslaved boy named Absalom Peters. And if you go to the Ayers family cemetery today, you can find his headstone, and it says, Here Lies. Well, it says Peter's Asylum, they got his name wrong. Uh, but a colored slave brought by William Ayers. And if the founders of these places are these white families and they brought with them these enslaved families, well then I think we should start to think of them as, as founding parts of these counties as well. Maybe forced founders, but founders all of the same. Uh, if we can have the Wrights, the Bluntons, and the Barbers, why can't we have Sal and Toby and Virtulus and Whiteball. So this painting behind me is an early painting of, of the Susquehanna River, and we can begin to think about what kind of, of labor enslaved persons might have done by, by imagining what Lancaster County looked like in 1730, <laughs> by, by thinking about what kind of work would have been required to transform what to the Europeans and the Africans would have seemed like an unsettled wilderness, uh, but certainly that is not what it felt like to the people who were already living here. So let's imagine ourselves uh, coming here from the east, from around Philadelphia, to, to plant a colony at Wright's Ferry in what is now Columbia. So much work comes before farming to get from point A to point B, you have to get here. You have to drive a cart. Uh, so you would have had enslaved persons, most likely, uh, driving these carts. Uh, they would have been taking care of the pack animals and the grazing animals as well. Animal husbandry would have been something that these individuals did. Uh, once they got here though, going back to that, that first slide, where are you going to live? So there is the cutting down of trees, the clearing of fields, the felling of forests, the, the plotting of, of roads, the construction of buildings, uh, woodworking, housekeeping, child rearing, uh, meal preparation. And then once you have a place to live, once you have put down your roots, then you can think about clearing the fields and sowing the wheat and, and doing the kind of labor that I think a lot of us associate with, with slavery. Now in Pennsylvania, there was certainly not a cash crop like there was in uh, the Deep South. We didn't have sugar, we didn't have tobacco, though there were some tobacco plantations in the eastern part of the state. Uh, we didn't have cotton, but there was wheat, and enslaved persons would have played an important role alongside indentured servants and other kinds of workers and family members with making sure that those fields were planted and that those crops were harvested. In this region of the state, there was also industrial forms of slavery, uh, iron furnaces most notably, and enslaved men were colliers. They burned wood to make charcoal to run the iron furnaces. They, they wrought iron. They did all kinds of, of labor here in Pennsylvania, um, which is really important for, for us to think about. If we're gonna talk about gradual abolition, we need to start with what it is that they were hoping to abolish in, in 1780. Now, before I get into gradual abolition, I just want to define a few terms. So gradual abolition refers to a process that begins in Pennsylvania in 1780, the first of the, the states to enact a gradual abolition program. It's a series of laws. It refers to the process of doing away with slavery slowly over time and the mechanism that the northern states used to accomplish this was giving freedom to the children of enslaved women after a period of service. In Pennsylvania, that period of service was 28 years. 
28 years. Uh, I'm also going to talk about something that I call term slavery. So scholars have referred to this 28 year period as serving an indenture or being a, a servant. And in my work, I talk about term slavery or being term enslaved. And I do this for, for a few reasons. I talk about term slavery because it is heritable. Unlike being an indentured servant, this is something that you are born with from your mother. It is racially restricted, right? Uh, you cannot be a 28 year term slave unless you are descended from a black person. So it is, it is racial as well. And not only do you inherit it from your mother, but for quite a while, actually, until 1826, you could pass that down to your grandchildren or even your great-grandchildren. The law was read in such a way that any person descended from a, an enslaved black woman could be held for 28 years. So I think term slavery is, in fact, the, the correct word to use rather than talking about being a servant or, or an indentured person. So those are the terms that, that I want to talk about. Here we're looking at the actual act for the gradual abolition of slavery. I took this photograph last summer uh, up at the Pennsylvania State Archives. Thank you, Ty, for showing this to me. And, and I adore this document. It, it reads up top, an act for the gradual abolition of slavery. But the word abolition is, is cut in half. <laughs> it doesn't make it all the way across the page. It is this perfect symbol for the way in which the process unfolded here in Pennsylvania. Now, it's a completely symbolic mistake, but I think it's an instructive image for how we should think about the promise of gradual abolition. So why this law? Why 1780? It's really a combination of two things, and if you read the law itself, they make this very clear in the prelude before they lay out what the law is going to do. Uh, and it's really two things, religion and, and Quaker agitation over in Philadelphia and the spirit of the revolutionary times. Throughout the law, there are references to British tyranny and American independence. And thank God that we are so lucky to be able to fight for our freedom. And, and thinking in those terms translated into a recognition that something should be done in the state and they had the votes. Uh, and so that was really where the impetus lay for gradual abolition in Pennsylvania. So what did the law do? The law required that Pennsylvanians register the people that they enslaved at the local county courthouse. Uh, it required that their children go free after 28 years, as I just mentioned. It made it illegal to bring an enslaved person into the state for longer than six months, unless you were a member of Congress. Because at the time, <laughs> Where was the capital in, 17, in 1780? It was Philadelphia, it wasn't yet in DC. And so the seat of government, of the federal government, was in Philadelphia. So there's a law carved out in the gradual abolition law saying you cannot bring your slaves with you to Pennsylvania unless you are a congressperson. Then you can. And, and this, this law was, was enforced. You know, you, Congress people expected if they were coming up from Virginia or Maryland or even New Jersey, that they'd be able to bring an enslaved servant or a coachman, a driver with them to, to be in Philadelphia. So that's what the law does. Uh, George Washington ran into some trouble with this because he's not a member of Congress and the law didn't say anyone in the federal government. Um, Erica Dunbar has, has written some great work on this. This law passed by a vote of 34 to 21 on March 1st, 1780, 34 to 21. Lancaster representatives voted three to six against passing the gradual abolition law. Six people voted no, uh, we do not want the gradual abolition law, and two people abstained. So out of a delegation of 11 representatives from Lancaster County, which was larger at the time, it included what's now Dauphin and, and Lebanon counties, uh, three people say yes, six people say no, and two people say we don't want to have our names attached to this bill. In fact, more delegates from Lancaster vote against the bill than from any other county delegation. And the only county with a worse record is Westmoreland, but they only have two representatives. <laughs> so Lancaster is uniquely opposed to this gradual abolition bill, and we actually know why this was the case, because there's a dissent 
that's filed into the, the law where they spell out exactly what the reasons were. And, and I'd like to, to read, oops, read this briefly, a, a paragraph from their dissent. If even the time were come when slaves might be safely emancipated, we could not agree to their being made free citizens in so extensive a manner as this law proposes. We think they would have been well satisfied and the legislature would have sufficiently answered their humane purposes had these unhappy people been able to enjoy the fruits of their labor and been protected in their lives and property in the manner that white persons are without giving them the right of voting for and being voted into offices, intermarrying with white persons, confronting them with their masters and being witnesses in every respect during the limited time of their servitude, which we fear in some instances may ruin families. So the concern of the people who vote against this law is that it's, we're fighting a war. This is 1780. This is not the right time to consider abolition. They're also concerned uniquely that, that freed people would not be fit for citizenship. And most interestingly is that for me is that, that last line, if you give an enslaved person the right to testify against a white person, uh, this might ruin families. White supremacy rested on the ability to control the, the forms of government, to con control power. Um, this is key. Uh, if, if you were to, to allow a black person into a courtroom, uh, it would ruin the white conception of what constituted their, their family. So that's what they say. There's another reason I think it's worth pointing out. It's that a lot of the people who voted on this bill were slaveholders themselves. Famous historians of abolition and slavery in Pennsylvania Gary Nash and Gene Soderland have written that overall, nearly half of the assemblymen for whom we have evidence own slaves. And those who were against the bill were twice as likely to own slaves as those who voted for the bill. So what does that mean in Lancaster? In Lancaster, it means that at least five of the six no votes were slaveholders themselves, and at least one of the two abstainers were slaveholders themselves, and maybe all eight of them. I say at least because it's tough to figure out exactly who was who during this time period. Here's an example of, of one of them, though. William Porter was a representative during this time period of Little Britain Township. He's a farmer. And he returned at the county courthouse 12 people who he registered as slaves to life. And uh, this document comes from the, the slave register here at Lancaster County. It is a transcription of a book that would have existed in the 18th century and it has the information and the names of slave holders of the enslaved. It sometimes will tell you who parents were so you can get a sense of family relationships. Uh, I find this document so remarkable because it suggests at a few things. You have Abner and Abe who are 14 years apart. Uh, are they brothers? You know, where did the two names come from? And then the age goes back up with this woman, Fanny, who I presume a woman, they didn't specify the gender in this particular document, followed by three children, Reach, Ned, and Dark. Uh, it seems likely that these are her children. You know, why register these people in, in this order? And then again, Bess and Dick, age 50 and 40, with two teenagers uh, listed thereafter. It seems to me like one way to read this document is with a suggestion uh, that these could have been family unit, <coughs> units that William Porter was aware of. Um, now certainly an irony of, of gradual abolition is that it's through these laws that we can actually have a sense of who these people were, uh, that we can begin to reconstruct the, the names, the lives, the family of enslaved peoples. Now there is a second law, I said this is a process, passed in 1788, that clarified a few things. Uh, you don't need a second law if the first law works out exactly the way you'd planned. <laughs> so this second law required that not only would you register enslaved people, but you also had to register their children. It required that slaveholders stop skirting the six month resi re residency requirement. People would come into the state with enslaved people, wait five and a half months, go back to Maryland and then come back in, hoping that that let them get around that requirement. It made it illegal and punishable by fine to bring a pregnant woman out of state to give birth in a slave state so that you could claim their children as slaves for life instead of for a term. Um, and it says that you can't split up families more than 10 miles 
uh, without their consent, and certainly not children unless they're above the age of four. Then you could sell them anywhere you wanted in the state. That's the 1788 law. What does this mean for Lancaster County? Well, this means that we know in 1788, 835 people are registered. Uh, I said this includes Dauphin and Lebanon County at the time. Within the borders of contemporary Lancaster, it's closer to 640 people in 1780. And then over the next 50 years, 434 children, these term slaves for 28 years, are registered for a total of, of 1,270 people whose names we know, whose family relationships we can begin to predict. Uh, these are really, really important records. Okay, so about 20 minutes in, we can move on to myths. There's five myths I wanna tackle in the next 25 minutes. It's five minutes of myth. Let's see if we can do this. <laughs> Number one, all Quakers and Germans were against slavery. Number two, Northern slavery was something called benign. Number three, white abolitionists uniquely are the bestowers of freedom. Number four, Northerners believed in racial equality. And number five, Pennsylvania abolished slavery in 1780. So myth number one, all Quakers and Germans were against slavery. So I say all because this is a, a fairly common belief, especially in this area of the state. It's the, the Scotch Presbyterians who are the slaveholders, not the Germans, not the Quakers. This is true in terms of numbers, but it does not mean that all Germans and Quakers were inherently against the system. I mentioned those founding families who, who brought enslaved people here before Lancaster County was a county. Well, they were Quaker families. Uh, Curtis Grubb in Ironmaster in what is now Lebanon Township, he owns his family, uh, Cornwall Furnace. He is, to my knowledge, the largest slaveholder in the state of Pennsylvania. He registers 25 people in 1780. He comes from a Quaker family. Uh, Paul Zantzinger, a German merchant here in Lancaster, he registers eight people with the county clerk in, in 1780 and then some of their children thereafter. So it's not that all Germans and Quakers are, are uniquely anti-slavery. It's that as a group, at an institutional level, they were more against slavery than their neighbors. Uh, there is one incredible source that I wanna take a moment to talk about though, and that is this German language fugitive slave advertisement. So for a long time, historians referred to enslaved people who left the service of their owners as fugitives, fugitive slaves. Some scholars have moved to talking about these people as self-emancipated people. They weren't fugitives, they, they set themselves free. I am sympathetic with that line of thinking, but I don't think it exactly works because self-emancipated implies that they succeeded, that there was a, some sort of legal change to their status. Uh, the term that I prefer, and I'm actually really happy to see this exhibit here uh, in, in this room tonight, is refugees from slavery. In a lot of ways, individuals who, who set off on their own resembled refugees. Uh, their status was precarious. They didn't have a claim to the place where they ended up. They had to struggle to find work, although the work was in high demand. So if you hear me talk about refugees from slavery tonight, this is what I'm referring to. And, and this German language advertisement was published in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1813 uh, by a Lancaster uh, slaveholder named Robert McKilvin and he is trying to recover a man named Jim or James who was 25 years old from Salisbury Township. Uh, he's used to doing farm work and is able to work with horses. We, we saw some of that imagery earlier with, with those paintings. It describes what he's wearing, it says if anyone manages to get him into a prison, uh, you will get this $30 reward. Uh, and then a note at the end, all persons are hereby warned not to house or host the suspect, otherwise they will be subject to the process of law. So uh, why this advertisement? Why German? Well, a lot of people speak German in, in this part of Pennsylvania, certainly more did then. There were German language newspapers. You did not have to be personally a slaveholder to profit from the institution of, of slavery. German language newspapers made money from running advertisements like this, just like their English language counterparts. Uh, slavery, the institution, benefited white communities writ large uh, in indirect ways such as this. And, and thinking about 
uh, not only the question that I have, because um, there's a lot of advertisements like this, not nearly as many, but they do exist, and, and I'd love someone with better German skills than myself, I had to ask a friend to do this, to study them systematically. Um, did everyone who ran a German language ad know German, or was there someone whose job it was to take these advertisements and translate them into German for the German language press to try to uphold the system of slavery? So that's myth number one. Myth number two, Northern slavery was benign. So slavery is violent everywhere. It's a system that's built up on violence. If you are going to purchase a human being, you are purchasing them to do work for you. I think there is a, a myth, not think, there, there is a long-standing belief about slavery, not just in the North, but everywhere. It's called the myth of paternalism, that these were happy families, extended families, that someone who, who subscribes to this way of thinking would have you believe that slavery existed only to make happy families. It's what historians have called the Moonlight and Magnolias approach to thinking about slavery after the famous film Gone with the Wind. Um, but this belief has endured in the North because there wasn't the plantation South. It, it did not have sugar and it did not have the slave calls and it did not have all of these things that we associate with the unique violence of slavery in the Deep South in the years before the Civil War. But all slavery depends on violence and on coercion. This is a 1782 advertisement for a woman named Hester who has made her, who has journeyed away from the woman who owns her, Elizabeth Ramsey, who lives in Bart Township here in Lancaster, and she has made her way to Newcastle in January 1782. And this advertisement is saying, hey, uh, Elizabeth Ramsey, we've, we've obtained and jailed Hester. If you want her, come and get her. And Hester is most likely in 1782 setting out for Newcastle in an attempt to get to the British lines. The war is still going on. The British army is actually emancipating uh, the enslaved people belonging to the American rebels. This is a war tactic similar to the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. The British figured this out in 1775 and say, if you are a black person who belongs to someone taking up arms against the king, come to the British army and we will free you. And they do. And so there's this massive irony of, of the Revolutionary War that if you are a black person in America, it's the British that has the best opportunity for your independence as opposed to the patriots who are fighting for independence. Um, so that's probably why she's trying to get out of, of Lancaster and to a port city <laughs> heading towards Delaware, but she doesn't succeed. And we know she doesn't succeed because Elizabeth Ramsey registers her uh, and she registers her children as well. So I, I mentioned that that 1788 law required the registration of, of these term slaves and we have two of those here at, at Lancaster History. We have a lot of them here, but there are two from Elizabeth Ramsey. And I, I just want to take a second to read the entirety of this top one of these. I think it, it speaks volumes. Be it known to whom these may concern that I, Elizabeth Ramsey, widow of Bart Township, Lancaster County, am illegally possessed of a Negro wench named Hester, she being a slave for life, if I so choose, and entered according to law. Now these are to certify that she, the said Hester, was on the night of the 13th or the morning of the 14th, days of March last, delivered in my house of a male child by us named Pete, given under my hand this fifth day of August, 1789. A slave for life if I so choose. Uh, I titled my talk after this slave return because she's right. Uh, gradual abolition means that if, if Elizabeth Ramsey wants Hester will remain a slave for life if she chooses. This is a woman in her 20s, uh, Hester. The children, uh, in this case, Pete, named by us Pete, not by Hester, but it seems like Elizabeth had a, a say in the matter, would serve for 28 years because of this registration document. This was Elizabeth Ramsey's way of, of asserting her control. Uh, she is a widow. Hester has left for the British once before. This document really speaks volumes about the kind of power 
she wishes that she had and that she in fact can can have by by going to the county courthouse and, and making these registrations. And she does it again. Two years later, Hester has another child, a, a boy named Bristow. And what I've underlined here is just this, this tragic, tragic sentence, I allow it to my daughter Isabella. In 1791, the breakup of Hester's family is what is knitting together the Ramsey family. The, the white Ramsey family is able to depend on this ability to, to trade and bequeath enslaved people to in-laws and children as a way of, of keeping their family together and ensuring that they have the resources that they need to be able to succeed. And this continues uh, well into the 19th century. So that's myth number two, that Northern slavery was somehow benign. Uh, myth number three is that the white abolitionists were those who bestowed freedom. Now, if the, the benign myth was the, the Moonlight and Magnolia's belief about slavery, uh, this is the belief of, of Lincoln as the great emancipator. This is not to say that Abraham Lincoln did not play a unique role in the abolition of slavery in this country. It's that without enslaved people themselves becoming refugees, taking up arms, writing petitions to free black communities in the North and agitating against slavery, well, there wouldn't be a reason to abolish it. If, if everyone believes that people are content, why get rid of the system? So the, the myth that the white abolitionists are those who by themselves are, are giving freedom is a, a, another dangerous myth that, that we should uh, try to combat a bit. And, and we can, there's important ways to think about the role that black people played in their own emancipation. Someone like Hester, who tried making it to the British lines, I imagine, or, or at the very least left. Lancaster is another way of, of thinking about this. So black people developed legal knowledge. They learned about their rights under the regime of gradual abolition. What we have here are two deeds of manumission. Uh, the top one is a man named Joseph Simon, a famous Jewish merchant here in Lancaster. He uh, emancipated a, a family that he had been holding in slavery just after the 4th of July in 1797. It was a young woman named Catherine and her two children, uh, William and Catherine. And a week later, Catherine's husband, a man named Pleasance, went to the courthouse and made sure that that manumission document got registered. He knew that you had to get in writing with the government uh, that this transaction, this deed has taken place at the instance of Negro Pleasance. I have registered the above manumission. So he made sure that they had more than just paper. They had the copy at the courthouse to say that yes, we are in fact free. He was aware of, of what he had to do for himself and his family. Uh, a few months earlier, a man named George McCullough had manumitted and then indentured a 40-year-old man named Joe. Joe would have been a slave for life, but uh, thanks to this, this manumission and indenture, the agreement was that Joe would work for George for another four years. He'd receive wages. He'd only have to work nine months of the year. He got winters off. And uh, after those four years, he would receive his complete freedom. Something happened in 1800 uh, in s because you have this document at the instance of Joe. I have registered this manumission indenture and I certify these to be a true copy of the original. So three years into this four year agreement, Joe goes to the courthouse and says, hey, I need to make sure that you have this in writing. Uh, black Lancasterians were becoming aware of their rights and they knew that they needed uh, these pieces of paper and these agreements with the local governments to, to protect themselves. And another way to think about the role of African Americans in the abolition movement is to think about the work of black abolitionist, black abolitionists themselves. I'm gonna talk about two uh, fairly briefly. Uh, William Whipper is, is the first person that I want to talk about. He was born into term slavery in Drewmore Township in 1804. 
in the 1820s after he has obtained his freedom, I believe a bit earlier than 28. I, I think he may have negotiated for, for a, a manumission. I don't think he self-purchased, but don't quote me on that. He goes to Philadelphia. He becomes involved in anti-slavery, abolitionism, anti-temperance movements. Uh, he comes back to Columbia here in Lancaster in 1835 to work with Stephen Smith, another person I'm going to talk about, uh, to help him with his lumber business and to organize and operate the Underground Railroad. Uh, there are black abolitionists involved in the Underground Railroad. Um, he did an incredible amount here in Lancaster and in Pennsylvania, but it's important to remember that he was born into term slavery. We have the registration document in July 26th of 1804, or sorry, February 22nd, 1804. He's registered in July. Uh, Stephen Boyd, a farmer in Seymour Township, returns Bill Whipper, uh, a mulatto or musty, a mixed race child. We know his mother's name, the son of Nance, who was a slave for life. And I find this document so remarkable. Bill Whipper, the term slave for 28 years, the property of Stephen Boyd, becomes William Whipper. He, he takes that first name and, and he makes sure that he writes with his pen under his first name. Uh, he pens in 1837 this really incredible pamphlet, an address on non-resistance to offensive aggression. It is this essay on non-violence as a tactic in the 19th century civil rights movement, um, you know, predating Thoreau's civil disobedience, something way before Gandhi and MLK, you have this man, Bill Whipper, who's, who's talking about the importance of nonviolence aggression. He says, we must be prepared at all times to meet the scoffs and scorns of the vulgar and indecent, the contemptible frowns of haughty tyrants and the blighting mildew of a popular and sinful prejudice. We must be ready to turn the other cheek. Uh, we must learn on all occasions to rebuke the spirit of violence, both in its sentiment and in its practice. Now, he writes this in 1837. The mid-1830s is the height of the anti-abolitionist movement in this country. Remember, the abolitionists were not popular. Uh, people did not like the abolitionists. They were considered to be fanatical. And uh, the following year, anti-abolitionists burnt down Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia. It was supposed to be an abolitionist meeting space. And three days after the ribbon cutting ceremony, it's razed to the ground. It is torched. And so you have William Whipper advocating nonviolence at this time when violence is all around him, but he sees this as, as a way forward. The other person I want to talk about is Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith is a really remarkable character. Uh, I found this portrait. Sorry, well, the portrait is common. I realized that there's a photograph of, of Stephen Smith, which I find really incredible. And I, I found it while digging around and preparing for this lecture. I was like, is that him? I, it, his name's not on it. He's coming up in the Google search of Stephen Smith, but I can't prove it. And then I found this labeled as Reverend Stephen Smith. And this could not more clearly <laughs> have been drawn from that, that photograph. So that was a, a really exciting find for me. I believe the original is at Temple University in Philadelphia. In any case, Stephen Smith, like William Whipper, is born into term slavery in York County, right across the river, in 1795. He's sold away from his mother once he is five years old, so he's not four anymore. Uh, he's sold across the river to Thomas Bood, who's a lumber merchant here in Lancaster in Columbia, and he learns the, the lumbering business. Um, he becomes incredibly successful, one of the wealthiest black men in the antebellum United States, certainly in Pennsylvania, and this attracts the ire of uh, Columbia's white community. They do not like that Stephen Smith is, is doing so well for himself in Columbia. And uh, you can see this is just an advertisement uh, about you know, his successful business, um, a large lot of assorted lumber containing Upwards of 250,000 feet of wood. It's piled up at the docks. Uh, a reasonable credit will be given. Come purchase this wood. But then he places another advertisement where he says, I offer my entire stock of lumber, either at wholesale or retail, uh, at a reduced price as I am determined to close my business at Columbia. So what happens? In the summer of 1834, there are two race riots, anti-black race riots in Columbia that are aimed explicitly at getting Stephen Smith to leave town. 
and they torch his office, they burn his house, uh, and he places this ad saying, I'm going to go. Now, the Wright family, who, who I mentioned earlier, their grandchildren do become abolitionists. Uh, William Wright and Samuel Wright, they are interested in doing away with slavery, and they stand up for Stephen Smith in the newspaper. So it, it's not all bad all the time. Mm -hmm. They are on the side of Stephen Smith, but he sticks around. Six months later, you get another advertisement where he says, it's been six months. Uh, I have not been <laughs> favored with an opportunity of completing my original design of leaving. Uh, I love how, how they write in the past. And he says, P.S., I do most cheerfully return my hearty thanks to my customers for the very liberal patronage I've always received. So it seems like the white community and the black community of Columbia who, who did not want to drive him out of town uh, made sure that they gave them his support and he sticks around for a while. Seven years after this, however, he does go to Philadelphia where he, uh, he runs the business remotely and William Whipper, his business partner, does a lot of the on the ground stuff here in Lancaster. But like I said, they, they use that connection and this Columbia, Lancaster, Philadelphia connection to, to shepherd people out of bondage in the South into freedom in, in the North. This is an important part of the story. But it's important to start with the fact that they were born as term slaves in Pennsylvania, right? Abolition only comes because there was something we had to abolish. The slavery part came first. And these are two remarkable men who were born and free here. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go through this one very quickly. Myth number four. Oh, right. Why this? Uh, William Whipper, his views on nonviolence evolved over time. <laughs> Men of color to arms to arms. This is from the Civil War era. And as you can see, William Whipper and Stephen Smith both sign this, this document advocating enlistment uh, in the United States Colored Troops. Myth number four. Northerners, all Northerners believe in racial equality. Well, I just mentioned the anti-black race riots in Colombia in an attempt to, to get Stephen Smith to sell his business to, to a white buyer. Uh, but there's also a really important document I would be remiss if I didn't bring up, and, and that's the mayor's registry of colored persons um, that was kept between 1820 and 1849 here uh, in the city of Lancaster. This was an effort to record the movement, the identities of black people who lived here in this community. Uh, why 1820? What had happened? Well, there was some precedent uh, for something like this. In 1803, in York County, across the river, there'd been a series of arsons. Uh, the black community is blamed. Um, there is a registration that happens there. There's a pass system, a curfew, all kinds of things that we might associate with the you know uh, 20th century South, uh, not the the 19th century North, uh, but there is some precedent for having a system like this. But a few other things had happened in 1818. The African Methodist Episcopal Church is established here in town. The city is incorporated in 1818. Uh, in Columbia, in Lancaster County, they form an abolition society, and in 1819, uh, freed people from Virginia come into Lancaster County, and the Wright family helps to settle them on what becomes Tow Hill in Columbia. So there are people moving from the South who are emancipated into the North, and there's fear that maybe something like what happened in York with those arsons might happen again here. So let's keep tabs on, on the area of the black population. This is just about the York uh, incident. These are two entries from what comes to be known as the Negro Registry. This is the very first entry from May uh, of 1820. And it's a man named Samuel Thompson who is saying that I just live right here on Queen Street with my wife and my daughter. And we also take care of my niece, uh, a young girl named Hannah, just making sure that he's registered so that he can continue working and that he is not uh, in violation of the law. And this is a, another registry from uh, a week later, it's a woman named Lydia Prophet, who is 60 years old and coming to Lancaster to visit her daughter from across the river in York. And, and she puts her name in the book because she wants to make sure that when she makes the effort to come visit her daughter, that she can stay for a day or two and try to make some money doing laundry. And that's why she ends up in this book, which continues uh, into 1849, uh, right? So just because someone is hostile to slavery 
does not mean they are hostile, or does not mean that they're necessarily welcoming of black people. And finally, and I'm getting close to time, I can do this. <laughs> the last myth is that Pennsylvania abolished slavery in 1780. What Pennsylvania did in 1780 was begin the process of gradually abolishing a system of bondage. They never switched to doing it all at once. There is a long-standing myth that in 1847, Pennsylvania finally passes a law saying we are done with slavery, but that actually doesn't happen. What happens in 1847 is called the Personal Liberty Law. Um, and, and we know that this doesn't happen for a number of reasons. One, uh, in 1858, the newspaper, the Lancaster Intelliger, Intelligencer, runs an article called The Last Slave, talking about the death of a man named Abram Kirk, who had been born in the 1760s and registered here in Lancaster. In fact, this is one of dozens of last slave in Pennsylvania advertisements <laughs> that run in the 1850s. There is this belief uh, that is tenable among northern white people uh, and northern black people as well. They have their own press by this, by this era that there could still be enslaved people in the state. Uh, we also know that Pennsylvania never actually abolishes slavery until the 13th Amendment um, because they kept trying and failing. I have found in my research at least five occasions when the General Assembly took up an immediate abolition bill and then failed to pass it. They fail in 1793, they fail in 1800, they fail in 1804, they fail in 1821, they fail in 1826. Let's pass a law for the, or the immediate abolition of slavery, and they don't do it. In 1826, this man, William Meredith, uh, offers the following resolution. A committee should be appointed to inquire into the propriety of making an immediate provision for the total abolition of slavery. And this resolution was adopted. He then reports a bill, an act for the entire abolition of slavery in Pennsylvania. The bill makes it into the House. Uh, a motion was made by Mr. Meredith to postpone the orders of the day for the purpose of proceeding to the consideration of the bill for the abolition of slavery. But it was negatived uh, 31 to 62, meaning his attempt to make sure that this bill came up for a vote was knocked down by 62 to 31, twice as many votes, and they never voted on that bill. In 1847, you have Lancasterians petitioning the General Assembly saying, please abolish slavery, uh, and it doesn't happen. So Pennsylvania enacts its gradual abolition legislation, and they do it deliberately, and it unfolds the way that they had intended it to, gradually. And I bring up, and I wanna end with William Meredith, because he has this great Lancaster connection. Uh, some of you might know it, but the original owner of, of Wheatland right next door was a man named Jenkins, and he sold it to William Meredith in 1845, and Meredith is the one who sells it to James Buchanan. Uh, basically, he, he wants to become a cabinet minister. Buchanan's already a cabinet minister. They trade a cabinet position for this house. <laughs> but for my money, if we're gonna be here in Lancaster and we're gonna have this incredible resource next door, the president's house, William Meredith needs to be a bigger part of the story. The man who, who tried his hardest to make sure that Pennsylvania abolishes the institution and, and cannot succeed. Uh, and if we're not gonna forget him, let's make sure that we don't forget the hundreds of black children who experienced decades of bondage uh, because he couldn't succeed. Thank you.